What's up, guys? Danny here from Geeks of Doom, and I'm back with our MCU rewatch, counting down all the MCU films en route to Black Widow on May 7th. Today's a big day for the MCU. Falcon and the Winter Soldier debuted, and quick thoughts on that episode. Uh, I thought it was fine. I, I didn't particularly love it. I did kind of think it dragged a little bit, and I think in part... It's less to do about Falcon and the Winter Soldier and more about uh, the combination of WandaVision being such a really different and unique show combined with having just watched the first six MCU films. Uh, so I guess I was expecting something a little faster paced, maybe a little more exciting. Uh, but I like where the show is going. I like the idea of Sam giving up the shield only to have him almost instantly replaced by a white Captain America. I love how that sets up all these uh, racial undertones that he's going to have to deal with. Uh, I like that the MCU is tackling things like that. Uh, and I liked the Bucky storyline. I just felt overall as a 45 to 50 minute episode that it did kind of drag. But it's not going to stop me from being back next Friday. That said, my son and I have rewatched all six phase one films. We finished watching the Avengers last night and this is, I mean, what else are you going to say about the Avengers? It is one of the biggest blockbusters ever made. This was the film, this was the proof of concept. You had six movies that all did relatively well in terms of critical and box office acclaim. Some of the films didn't do so great. Some of the films got better critical. Uh, some films did better financially in phase one from Iron Man, Incredible Hulk, Iron Man 2, Thor, and Captain America First Avenger. But then you had the Avengers, and you had a movie that went out there and made $1.5 billion worldwide and was the proof of concept that this MCU thing that they were doing, the Avenger Initiative, uh, the this cinematic universe was the way to go. And they spent five movies setting up for this story. And I've rewatched this movie. It's got to be from beginning to end about a dozen times now in the last nine years and it never doesn't amaze me uh there are still scenes that i've seen over a dozen times that give me goosebumps uh that make me smile from ear to ear this is just it's it's just such a perfect example of what a blockbuster movie should be uh, and a lot of that has to do with the creative, and I don't want to spend too much time talking about that because, obviously, you don't want to go around heaping praise on Joss Whedon right now. Uh, all the allegations that came out from people from the Buffy series, which one of my favorite series, my wife got me into the Buffy series, and we watched all seven seasons. We were even... Uh, and we still are showing my daughter uh, the Buffy episodes and she loves them. Uh, it's really disappointing to hear uh, what a jerk Whedon ended up being. Um, it's also kind of interesting that I'm talking about the Avengers uh, the day after <laughs> the, the, the Zack Snyder Justice League cut was released and is pretty much getting universal praise uh, from fans online. Uh, I know I'm a big user of the Stardust app uh, and almost everybody I know in the Stardust community who has sat down for all four hours of the Justice League, uh, the Zack Snyder cut, they love it. So I, I understand the irony of me talking about a Joss Whedon movie that's actually good, The Avengers, uh, while Zack Snyder's movie is blowing his Justice League out of the water. But that's all I'll say about Whedon. Whedon was, I mean, he was, keyword was, the god of geek and nerd culture uh, between Buffy and, and Firefly and, and this. 
uh, and it's just a shame. Uh, so we'll leave him behind. I do want to bring up right away Alan Silvestri. The score in this movie would become iconic. Uh, he's a guy who's brought us some of the greatest scores in film history. Back to the Future, of course. He was nominated for an Oscar for his Forrest Gump score. He also did the Predator score, which is one of the best scores in action movie history. And this movie gets off to a literal bang. And I think actually the only part in this movie that I, I don't necessarily know if it's the strongest part of the movie is the way this movie opens. We open with the S.H.I.E.L.D. base where they are experimenting on the Tesseract and things are getting out of hand and it just, boom, we have an energy blast and Loki shows up in what I wrote down as his Terminator entrance. Uh, if you go back and watch Terminator and Terminator 2, you have your electrical field, big shiny blue light, and then the Terminator is just there crouched down, ready to kick ass. And that's Loki. Last time we saw Loki was, of course, the end of Thor. And he, the rainbow bridge gets broken, the Bifrost is broken, and Loki kind of lets go and drifts off into space. And we're assuming, at first, maybe he's dead. By the end credits of Thor, we realize he's not dead, and he's still behind the scenes kind of pulling strings. And he immediately... In kind of like a cold open scene, he receives the staff from this mysterious being in space who lots of people, including myself, got very excited about because we started to think, oh my God, could it be? It turned out not to be him just yet, but we'll get to that later. Um, he uses the staff to kind of just take over uh, Nick Fury's team, including Selvig and Hawkeye. They get brainwashed, and it turns out that the staff contains what would become the Mind Stone. Uh, of course, the Mind Stone, one of the Infinity Stones, the Mind Stone that would eventually be put into the head of a certain cybernetic organism that would become Vision. Uh, so we get this whole shield base cold open <coughs> Um, where Loki escapes with Hawkeye and Selvig. Uh, Maria Hill and Fury have to escape as the building, and Coulson have to escape as the everything collapses around them. And it's time to bring in the Avengers. And then we get this long setup sequence, which basically involves several mini fights and pairings of characters and what this movie does so well is we have established all of these characters over five movies so whatever I, I i believe in what's called the rule of two if you have any two characters on screen that have good chemistry it can drive a movie or a tv series or whatever and this movie does that in spades because you always have pairs or groups of characters that just have phenomenal chemistry. And in part, it's because they've spent five movies setting it up. So it could be Tony Stark talking to Chris Evans, uh, talking to Steve Rogers, and they are openly competing with each other. They have vastly different ideological ideas. And of course, they're sowing the seeds here for what would become Captain America Civil War <laughs> two whole phases away. Uh, you have Tony Stark and Bruce Banner as these like, you know, kind of like buddy scientists and Stark is, you know, teasing him about, you know, want to see the, the green rage monster. You have Banner and Natasha uh, and they're great together and they have their, and I love the scene right at the beginning when Natasha goes to basically draft the banner into the Avengers and he like yells at her just to get her to draw her gun. And he like laughs at her and, you know, he, he's like, I thought, you know, I thought it was just you and me. Meanwhile, she has an entire team around them, but they have great chemistry together. And of course that would spin out in age of Ultron, where we start to see what could be the blossoming of a relationship between the two of them. Uh, oh, my, 
Disney Plus reset. Come on. Let's see. Oh, no. That's not good. Whatever. Yeah, I'll go back to Disney Plus. It'll show superheroes on the screen. Who else do we have in this movie? Oh, of course, Loki is there. Loki has great chemistry with pretty much anybody he's talking to because Tom Hiddleston is just so freaking charismatic. And his plan gets put in place. And Loki here plays, he does such a great job, Tom Hiddleston, at playing the big bad in the movie while also obviously being a puppet. He is very clearly, sorry, Big Hero 6 is distracting me. He's very clearly a puppet for whoever has given him the staff. And that is... Uh, that's a very complex role to play. He's got to act like the big bad while simultaneously, uh, you know, acting like he doesn't have it all under control. And Hiddleston just does a great job. Coulson is great in this movie. I love the scenes where he so blatantly fanboys over Captain America. It's, it's adorable. Um, Thor shows up after Loki is captured and we get our first of what is three or four different Avengers fighting Avengers scenes. I love the way this movie, uh, I love the way what this movie does is it prolongs the Avengers scene, that classic moment about 40 minutes left in the movie where we finally get them all together. It prolongs that by introducing these characters, showing us the tension that they have between each other, and then pairing them off into fights. We get this great Thor versus Iron Man fight. And then Captain America joins into that, and it becomes almost this, you know, to use a wrestling phrase, like a, a, a triple threat match between Cap, Thor, and Iron Man. Then uh, we finally get uh, Banner after uh, Hawkeye, who's still brainwashed by Loki, after he attacks uh, the Hela Carrier, I think it's called. Uh, he, the uh, Banner becomes the Hulk. We get this great sequence where he's chasing Natasha. Not really a fight, but it's more of just like Iron, uh, the Hulk trying to basically kill Black Widow and her doing everything she can to get away from him. We eventually get Hawkeye versus Natasha in this really cool hand-to-hand -hand fight scene where she knocks him out and that leads to him to finally waking back up and becoming Hawkeye, you know, an Avenger rather than just a brainwashed lackey. Uh... Tons of great stuff here. This movie also, uh, I wrote down, this is one of the most gifable movies that you'll ever see. Uh, there's so many one-liners that, because of things like Twitter and social media, have just become gifable moments. Some of my most favorite gifts. In fact, every single time somebody makes a joke. My friend Chris uh, made uh, a joke today on social media and I responded with Captain America's um I understood that reference gifable moments you have uh <laughs> you have Thor claiming that Loki's my brother he killed millions of people he's adopted you have Robert Downey Jr that man is playing Galaga you know he calls Thor point break these are, you know, the fact that he's wearing a Black Sabbath shirt, Iron Man, these are all such great little individual moments in the midst of this blockbuster two-hour, 20-minute epic movie. Um, I will bring up the fact that, because I said this to my son when we were watching it, Loki's plan, not a great plan, according to Robert Downey Jr. later in the movie. But Loki's plan is to get the mineral that he needs to basically launch the beam that opens the portal. Use the Tesseract, the Space Stone, to open the portal to space so that the Shatari army can attack. 
it requires this element and his plan is to go and get the element and then basically get captured. And while he's captured, it's going to lead him to, you know, uh, set the Hulk loose and do all of these other things. And I said to my son, I, the bad guy whose plan involves getting trapped, it feels like such a tired trope. Uh, because it just requires a level of suspension of disbelief that I don't know I can always stretch. There's like plans that come to fruition and then there's, and then there's, come on, this plan is a little too far-fetched. Um, so I'll give you an example. Uh, the Joker does this in The Dark Knight. He intentionally gets caught and brought to the police station so that a criminal with a swallowed phone can explode and cause everyone in that police station to be down except for Heath Ledger's Joker. Uh, then you have, what was it, Skyfall. Skyfall, um, the villain in that movie, Silva. His whole plan involves getting caught so that he can program a train to almost kill Bond so that he can get to M. There's just all of these, a lot of these action movies around from, from like 2008 all the way up to like 2015, 16, there was a lot of the supervillain gets caught on purpose trope. Um, Loki, again, I can forgive it because Tom Hiddleston is so good here. He has great moments of dialogue with Nick Fury. He has great moments of dialogue with Scarlett Johansson. He has great moments of dialogue with Phil Coulson, who's... What, what's Phil Coulson's name? I forgot the actor's name. That's terrible. I feel bad for Coulson. But I did remember his name is Phil. I'm going to remember it as soon as I end this video. Yeah. Um... The Avengers, of course, they get separated. Loki gets freed. I love the scene with Harry Dean Stanton. Rest in peace, Harry Dean Stanton, of course. Famous, well, great actor. Um, alien, Repo Man. Uh, he finds the Hulk and he makes a great joke about how, you know, I found you naked. Uh, are you an alien? I, th I think that was very funny. Uh, Nick Fury, Samuel Jackson gets a great speech moment after Coulson's death where he gets to kind of use Coulson's death to unite the team back together. And then we get to the last 40, 45 minutes of this movie, which is non-stop action involving the opening of the portal the Shatari army attacking New York. So you have the attack on Loki at Stark Tower combined with all of the Avengers coming together to fight the Shatari army. You get that absolutely amazing shot of the six of them finally after five and a half movies after... It's after about an hour and 45 minutes of this movie coming together and you get that wraparound shot of all of them, uh, the Hulk yelling, Iron Man in suit, Hawkeye arrows blazing, Natasha guns blaring. Just a perfect shot, a goosebumps inducing moment. Uh, and it's one of the moments that will live on in cinema history. And, and I truly mean that. I don't just mean in superhero movies or in the MCU. That is an all-time cinema shot right there. Uh, and again, that was the proof of concept. That shot and that shot brought people back to see this movie in theaters two, three, four times. By the time it was done, it was... Uh, between 1.5 and 1.6 billion worldwide, one of the highest grossing movies ever made. And yeah, it it still works. Even with, 
you know, some, I can, I can pull some, some flaws here and there, but it still works. Even at the end, uh, when they start to talk some sense into Loki and you get the great scene with, uh, Stark taking off his armor and Loki's revealing his plan and we get, oh, not a great plan. I have an army. We have a Hulk. And he goes to brainwash Stark, but it hits the uh, the arc reactor in his, che his chest piece and doesn't work. Just great stuff there. We get Thor uh, and Hulk working together and then Hulk punching Thor out of the shot uh, as a kind of a payback for earlier in the film. I forgot to mention in the Avengers fighting Avengers scene, Thor and Hulk have a great fight after... Hulk chases Black Widow through the ship. Thor goes after him. And a great scene. He throws Mjolnir at him. Hulk catches Mjolnir and then falls down and can't get up. Just so much great stuff in this movie. And we get, of course, uh, Loki screaming at the Hulk. I am a god. And then boom, 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 boom. Puny god. Uh, I got to talk about Mark Ruffalo for a second. This is his debut in the MCU. Uh, obviously, we, we brought it up. Edward Norton, the Incredible Hulk in Incredible Hulk. I really liked him. I thought he was excellent as uh, Bruce Banner. Uh, I And I thought that he really worked. Um, and I thought that he would have been great in this movie. But Ruffalo was fantastic here. I love the way he is constantly both confused and aloof while being uh, a match for Tony Stark in terms of intelligence. Uh, I love that he does feel damaged in this movie, uh, which I think he does better than Edward Norton. Edward Norton was, you know, constantly on the run. Uh, he felt wronged. But uh, Ruffalo feels damaged. And he even, earlier in the movie, he says, you know, I, I, put a, I, I got low and I put a bullet in my mouth and the big guy spit it out. So this is a guy, Ruffalo is playing a character here who is kind of at his last limits where it's like, I just want it to end and the Hulk won't even let me do that. Um, so I really like Ruffalo in this movie. And then we get the end. They defeat Loki. 40 minutes of epic fighting. Uh, great scenes in this fight of in New York. Uh, Tony catches the nuclear weapon, sends it up into space. I remember thinking, ironically, I remember thinking 2012, seeing this in theaters going, wow, they, they could kill Iron Man. Like, this could be it. Like, he's going to sacrifice himself and... That's going to be the end. That's his character arc. And, of course, I was wrong. Uh, they actually do use his near-death experience as fuel for the PTSD story uh, of Iron Man 3, which is one of the parts I really enjoy about Iron Man 3. There are parts I don't enjoy about Iron Man 3, but that's the next video. That is the start of Phase 2. Um, and then, finally... There's only one last thing we have to talk about, and that is the post credit sequence. That's right, folks. Shwarma. No, uh, that's the very end credit scene. Funny little scene. Uh, Easter egg, if you didn't realize that in that scene, Chris Evans, during the Shwarma scene, Chris Evans, Captain America, is sitting there like this the whole, mo the whole time. He, he doesn't reveal his face. And a lot of people speculated that the reason he, is, he was covering his mouth is because he was laughing the whole time. In reality, I think he had grown... That scene was filmed later and he had grown a, almost a full beard. I think his next movie after The Avengers was Bong Joon-ho's Snowpiercer. I, I'm going to feel really stupid if I'm wrong there, but I think that movie came out in 2013 and this movie was 2012. So I think what had happened was he had grown a thick beard... And he just didn't want, he didn't want to shave it, of course, because he was doing another movie. So he was just like, all right, I'll just cover my face and I'll act like I'm eating and maybe laughing and nobody will notice. 
No, the scene I have to talk about is the scene that, aside from Nick Fury showing up at the end of The Avengers and telling Tony Stark, I want to speak to you about the Avenger initiative, the arguably the most important uh, and most jaw-dropping uh, end credit sequence is the Thanos reveal. This space alien who had given Loki the staff at the beginning says, we can't mess with the humans. To mess with them would be to court death. And then the camera pans up and Thanos turns around and there were cheers, loud, like gasping cheers when people saw him in the movie theater. My favorite comic series when I was a kid, and I, I didn't keep up with comics once I got past a certain age. I, my geekdom went into other areas, horror movies, pro wrestling, uh, yeah, movies in general. I, I got out of comics. I, I went into a big Harry Potter phase. But the Infinity Gauntlet, the, that six-part series by Jim Starling in, I believe it was 1991, was the pinnacle for me in comics. And I must have read it from cover to cover, all six issues, countless times. I had... I still have uh, pieces of that comic f embedded in my brain. I would love to one day get a tattoo of the, uh, the the cover art of Infinity Gauntlet number four, which is just Thanos in the blank void of space with the Infinity Gauntlet, you know, kind of taunting the heroes, you know, bring it on. I think he, well, he says something cool. I don't remember exactly. See, I said I remember everything. I then I forgot. But that that image of him with the gauntlet taunting the heroes while he's alone in space is just burned into my in my memory. When I saw him in the end credits, and I started to envision where this series was going to go, I couldn't have dreamed that it would go to Infinity War and Endgame, the way that it did. But th that reveal was epic. It was jaw-dropping. People screamed when that happened. Uh, and that's the Avengers. I didn't mean to talk about it for this long, but it's worth it. It is, it is an epic film that manages to live up almost a decade later to uh, the hype that it had at the time. And I think it holds up to this day. Um, now that I finished phase one, uh, Brandon, my son and I, we struggled on coming up with our individual lists of phase one movies. I don't want to reveal my entire list because obviously the more films we watch, the more the list will change. But... I think by default, just because of all of the characters and how perfectly they mesh together, uh, the humor, the great action sequences, the set pieces, the infighting of the Avengers, uh, you know, the fact that we get Thor versus Iron Man, Thor versus Hulk, Hulk versus Black Widow, Black Widow versus Hawkeye, we get all these scenes. I think I have to still put the Avengers as the best film in phase one. Iron Man for me is the best individual film, individual character film of phase one. But the Avengers, I think, has to top that list for now anyway. So that's it for the Avengers. We will next be covering the first movie in phase two. And the first of, so far, oh, I guess there's four part threes because we have Civil War, Ragnarok, and of course, I guess Infinity War is technically Avengers part three. But the first 
part three, uh, the film that actually culminates the Iron Man trilogy, Iron Man 3, uh, starring Robert Downey Jr., Gwyneth Paltrow, and uh, that movie has a villain situation that was very controversial. And we will talk about that in our next video here on Geeks of Doom. We are counting them down until May 7th, okay? We have about six more weeks to get through the MCU. Falcon and the Winter Soldier is now streaming on Disney+. Plus, So uh, we'll talk about episode two of that when we get up to it. Uh, but until then, this has been Danny from Geeks of Doom. This was The Avengers. It's really good. You should watch it. And we'll see you next time.